Hi everyone. Uh, today's lecture is going to be on the transpose of a tensor, symmetry and skew symmetry of tensors. So the transpose of a tensor is denoted with a superscript capital T, just like the transpose of a matrix. Like that. <clears throat> and it's defined to be the tensor that satisfies the following relation with respect to the inner product. satisfies v dot the vector that is the outcome of t acting on u is equal to the outcome, so the vector that is given by t transpose acting on v inner product u for all u and v in our vector space. So we showed that we can construct tensors given a basis using, given a basis for v um, using the tensor product. So what is the transpose of the tensor product of two vectors will be worth investigating. Well, <clears throat> let's plug that into our definition of the transpose right here. So we have v dot a tensor b acting on u is equal to v dot a times b dot u. All right, well, we could also get this same result here from that is equal to u. dot b tensor a acting on v right because you would have the a dot v times b dotted with u so you get the same thing so this here is a tensor, and it behaves in this way. So this is equal to a tensor b transpose. So in other words, the transpose of the tensor product of two vectors simply reverses the order. Now it's also easy to show that a plus B transpose is equal to A transpose plus 
B transpose. <clears throat> and this is a, an easy consequence of the linearity of the inner product. Um, and this is one of the exercises in the textbook. It'll take you a couple lines. Um, I'd suggest that you work through it just to demonstrate to yourself that this is in fact the case. You get your feet wet using direct notation instead of index notation that we typically use. Um, you can use index notation and a basis if you want, but you don't need to. All right, so what if we have a tensor and it's expressed in components relative to an orthonormal basis? Um, and in the book, you know, all of these index notation things that they're doing um, are always with respect to an orthonormal basis. And it's because the, you know, the inner product between EI dot EJ with an orthonormal basis will be delta IJ. Um, so it makes everything easier. So <clears throat> you'll always want to use them <clears throat> when you're doing manipulations, trying to prove that two expressions are equal, things like that. Um, and it's only when we're talking about deforming a basis that you need to worry about ones that aren't orthonormal. Since if you're, say, squishing a region of space, maybe it started out as an orthonormal basis, but if it was, you know, pinned to the material and you squish it, it won't remain orthonormal. All right, so let's say We have this tensor T expressed in components relative to an orthonormal basis. which we'll call the set EI, and I put hats over them when they're orthonormal, just to distinguish it as a special type of basis. Um, he doesn't in the book, but I would ask that you do in your homework. Um, and there again, I'll give you <coughs> a LaTeX command to kind of shortcut that. but it would be the, um, the wide hat <coughs> or just hat option in the tech. Um, I'll just make a shortcut for it. All right, so T, the tensor, is equal to its components, T, I, J, times the unit vector E, I, tensor, the unit vector E, J. So this is T, <clears throat> the tensor expressed in components relative to the natural basis for the space of second order tensors given our basis for the vector space. Well, we just showed that the transpose of a tensor product just switches the order of multiplication here, and you sum them together. So T transpose is just going to be the sum of all of the transposes. So it's still T I J because that didn't do anything. And then we just transpose the tensor part, right? The transpose of a scalar is, well, it's just a scalar, so you can't really transpose it. Um, so this is going to be E J. tensor EI. Um, and so this is true, but the way that we have these ordered here compared to, oh, by the way, um, right now I'm circling this with 
what's supposed to be a, a laser thing. Um, if you couldn't see that, please let me know, since I'm assuming that that works. <clears throat> At any rate, um, so we have the ordering of this natural basis where it's ordered first by this one and then by this one. So this one's ordered by J and then by I, which is kind of not the way that we usually do things. But they're all dummy indices, so we can just switch them and it will still be correct. So this will be the way that you're probably more used to thinking of it. T, J, I, <coughs> E, I, tensor, E, J. All right, so that is what the uh, the tensor transpose is. So you just transpose the scalar components relative to an orthonormal basis. That would not necessarily be the case if it weren't an orthonormal basis. Um, <clears throat> and you get the transpose of T. All right, so now symmetric and skew symmetric tensors. So back to this transpose thing, um, if you used the non-inner product stuff, so you retain the dual space and the tensor product is between a vector and a co-vector, um, then when you have the, the basis and the dual basis, you do still end up with the transpose being, you just transpose the, uh, the scalar components but the, the flip side of it is that then the transpose doesn't map V to V. It maps the dual space of V to the dual space of V. Um, so that's a <clears throat> little bit of a you know, distinction where the... Um, the way where you keep track of the dual space actually makes things a little easier if you understand it, but um, <clears throat> you don't need to know that at this point or for this class. All right, so a tensor is symmetric if it is equal to its transpose. And it's skew symmetric if it is equal to the opposite of its transpose. I guess I, for consistency's sake. like that. <clears throat> so that's a negative sign there. Let's make it a more obvious one. So every tensor S can be uniquely decomposed into its additive symmetric and skew symmetric parts.
And one nice thing about this decomposition is it's a really easy one to calculate. Um, there are other decompositions like where every tensor can be factored into the product of an orthogonal and a symmetric tensor. Uh, that one can be difficult to calculate, whereas this one is quite simple to calculate. So we have the symmetric part, which will denote sim of s is equal to 1 half s plus s transpose. And the skew part, denoted skw, like in the textbook, is equal to 1 half s minus s transpose. So s is clearly equal to sim s plus skew s. You see that the two one halves on the s term add together to one, and the plus one half minus one half on the transpose cancels out. And so now let's um, show, and it will be quite simple to show, that this one is symmetric and this one is skew symmetric by looking at the transpose. So the transpose at sim s is equal to 1 half, nothing happens to that, and then the transpose of s is s transpose, and there's plus the transpose of s transpose is just s again. <coughs> right, and so that is equal to sim s and if we look at the transpose of skew s that is equal to one half s transpose minus s, which is minus skew s. So in components, relative to an orthonormal basis. We have, of course, that S is equal to S I J E I tensor product E J and S transpose is the same thing except with the transpose of the scalar component list. So S J I E I tensor E J. <coughs> so the components of sim S and skew S relative to this orthonormal basis go like this. So if we have a second order tensor, it'll have two components. And if we have a vector expression, it'll have 
one scalar component. And if we have a big expression that is in direct notation, you know, so things like this and u cross v or something, we can always just uh, put the whole thing in parentheses and say we're looking at whatever component of it, like this. Um, sim s. We're looking at the ij component of that is equal to 1 half sij plus sji. <coughs> And the ijth component of skew, symmetric part of s, is equal to 1 half sij minus <coughs> sji. So, you know, for like a vector, you could... Um, notational example here. We could look at the ith component of well, let's say we could look at the ijth component like that. Right, so we've made a tensor, and this is saying that we're looking at the ijth component of it relative to our orthonormal basis. Um, or we could look at like u cross v. We'll talk about the cross product in a second, but that'll be a vector. If you look at the ith component of it. All right, so having talked about the cross product there, let's, um, let's introduce the vector cross product since we skipped it during the vector part of things on account of I said that it fits more nicely in with skew symmetric tensors, and uh, we'll show why in a second. So remember, the cross product is a uh, R3 only. So our vector space V is a three-dimensional vector space that, you know, has a, uh, an inner product and therefore an orthonormal basis. And we have picked an orientation for it. And that is how we can have a cross product. An orientation meaning we've defined a right-handed order of the uh, the basis vectors. <clears throat> so that gives you like positive and negative volumes and area vectors that go one way or the other based on the right-hand rule. <clears throat> so in R3, we can define the vector cross product. So the cross product, which is just the times symbol, maps two elements of the vector space to another element of the vector space with u cross v representing the oriented area normal vector to the parallelogram spanned by u and v with the orientation given by the right-hand rule.
right? So if we have, say, um, u and v, then u cross v is the magnitude of u cross v is the area of this parallelogram and it is directed um, perpendicular to both u and v. So in this case, u cross v is out of the page, and v cross u is into the page. Um, so it's based on the right-hand rule. <clears throat> so if we say that sine theta is the interior angle between u and v, um, which is to say the angle that is less than or equal to pi in radians, then the magnitude of u cross v looks like this. Magnitude of u cross v is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the sine of the interior angle between them with 0 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to pi. Given three vectors in our three-dimensional vector space that has a cross product, um, the volume of the parallelepiped spanned by them is given by the magnitude of the vector triple product. Good one to put on a spelling bee or something, right? P A R. Yeah, I'd say that's how it's spelled, probably. So the absolute value of u dot v cross w, which is also equal to the absolute value of w dot u cross v, which is also equal to the absolute value of v dot uh, w cross u. Right, and uh, I've retained the ordering here. So in fact, those three are all equal to one another without the absolute value, but they might be negative. Um, if the volume is non-zero, so if the vector triple product like that is non-zero, then those three vectors are linearly independent and form a basis for our three-dimensional vector space V.
the ordered basis, so now it's not just a collection of three, it's an ordered collection of three, is positively oriented if u dot v cross w is greater than zero. So it would be a right-handed basis. All right, so given a positively oriented orthonormal basis, so this is kind of what you'd see in the talk about Cartesian coordinate frames in chapter one. We've already shown that EI dot EJ is delta IJ. delta ij is the Kronecker delta, which is 1 if i equals j and 0 otherwise. Um, it's also the case that there is a relationship between the vector triple product and the alternating symbol or levi Shavita symbol. So it is also the case. E I dot E J cross E K is equal to epsilon I J K, which is called the alternating symbol or Levi Shavita symbol. That one right there. And it satisfies E I J K is equal to first case it's 1 if i j k is equal to an even permutation of 1 2 3 so those are 1 2 3 <coughs> 2 3 1 and 3 1 2 it's negative 1 <clears throat> if i, j, k is an odd permutation of those three, so that would be 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, and 3, 2, 1, and 0 if any index is repeated. So we use a left <coughs> curly brace like that for uh, when we have multiple cases. And in the tech, um, there is a cases command. So it would be like slash begin cases, slash end cases, um, if you wanted to make that. And so this is the...
like that. <coughs> so given <coughs> an orthonormal basis, uh, the component of it, I forget whether we'd mentioned this before, but the components of an orthonormal basis, or rather the components of a vector relative to an orthonormal basis are given simply by the inner product with the basis elements. Um, in general, it would be the inner product with the reciprocal basis. But for an orthonormal basis, uh, it is its own reciprocal basis. So um, v i, the ith component, is just equal to v <coughs> dot e i, like that. So from this relation for the scalar components, and looking up at this, we can see that the ith component of ej cross ek is epsilon ijk. Let's see if we can, yeah, like that. Whoop. ej cross ek is equal to epsilon i j k e i. <coughs> so if we look at the cross product of two vectors expressed relative to this orthonormal basis, It is equal to u j e j cross v k e k. We can move the scalar components out um, <coughs> because everything is linear. So that is equal to u j v k and then e j cross e k well, that is equal to u j v k epsilon i j k e i and like i've said before the um, order of multiplication of scalar components doesn't matter because the ordering is actually determined by the indices and not by their order in here. Um, so that's the same thing as I think it always looks a little nicer or maybe you don't miss things if you put your epsilons and your deltas out at the fronts of the terms um, and kind of order them in a way that makes sense. So like E, I, J, K, U, J, V, K. <coughs> e, I. Um, and so I, I tend to try to order things this way when I have an epsilon where it's like, um, okay, here's the I is the free index. The first one is gonna be your well, how did that happen? I don't, I want it to go away. Come back. No, stop. Mm. Oh, 
There we go. Technology, man. Terrible. All right. So at any rate, I like the first index to be the one that is going to multiply the uh, basis vector there. And then the second index to be the left one in the cross product and the third index to be the right one in the cross product. Um, you don't have to do it that way, you know, because you can permute things around and sometimes <clears throat> it uh, makes sense to permute them. So like in other words, you know, E, I, J, K is also equal to um, E, J, K, I is equal to E, K, I, J. So, <clears throat> you know, sometimes if you're doing a uh, derivation or you're trying to prove left-hand side of something is equal to the right-hand side, um, you need to swap out E, I, J, K for one of these to get things to work out right. Um, and you can, but unless I'm doing that specifically for something, I kind of tend to try to keep it in this sort of form um, just because it's easier to remember what you're looking at. <clears throat> and you make fewer mistakes if you do things the same way every time. Unless you run into, you know, a good case to do it differently. All right, so we can look at that in component form. <coughs> um, the ith component is equal to e i j k u j v k <clears throat> there are a few identities relating epsilons and deltas and numbers that'll come in mighty handy when we're doing some algebraic manipulation and when we start getting into calculus and proving that curls of divergences are zero and things like that um, so those, the first one is the epsilon delta identity. And then the other ones that we're going to write down all fall out of the epsilon delta identity. versus epsilon delta. <coughs> and that is that E, I, J, K, E, I, P, Q is equal to <coughs> Delta J P Delta K Q minus Delta J Q Delta K P and consequently We have <coughs> epsilon i j k epsilon i j l is equal to two delta k l. And finally, epsilon i, j, k, 
epsilon i j k is equal to six. <coughs> so this is um, you know specifically in three dimensions, but the epsilon only really applies to three dimensions. All right, so now that we've introduced the cross product um, in the middle of symmetric and skew symmetric tensors, let's examine the correspondence that the cross product creates, and this is only in three dimensions, between skew symmetric tensors and vectors acting under the cross product. Um, and this will give rise to the concept of axial vectors where every vector has a corresponding skew symmetric tensor and every skew symmetric tensor has a corresponding axial vector um, and this only applies to three-dimensional space <coughs> Let's start a new page. So let's define the tensor W cross to be the one that maps any vector U to W cross U. All right, so first, is it a tensor? <clears throat> well, let's do it in index notation relative to an orthonormal basis, um, W cross U is equal to E I K J W K U J E I. Um, so I've chosen k to be the second index here and j to be the third, which of course you're free to do. You don't have to order them i, j, k. Um, you can pick whichever one you want for what. It's really the fact that the second one here goes with the left. When the first one goes with your basis vector, then the second one goes with the left side of your cross product and the third one goes with the right side components in your cross product is the important part <clears throat> so you know we just switched the order of things because it works out nicer basically all right well we can make a tensor that does this
So that tensor uh, does what we want it to, <coughs> to every vector u. Since two tensors are equal, if they do the same thing to every vector, um, then it's unique, and it is exactly this tensor is what w cross is equal to. So um, now I'm stipulating that it is skew symmetric, but we can uh, we can show that it is to what is w cross transpose. Well, we can do the transpose in components. So we just switch the i and the j of the components while leaving the i and the j of the tensor basis the same. that. All right, well, um, epsilon jki has to be equal to minus epsilon i k j, because it's an odd permutation. So omega, or w cross transpose is equal to minus E I K J W K E I tensor product E J. Well, we see that that is equal to minus <coughs> W cross. So it is skew symmetric. So all right, given any vector, we have a corresponding skew symmetric tensor that can be generated from it under the cross product. Um, but now we're also going to show that all skew symmetric tensors <coughs> in R3 can be represented as a cross product with a vector called their axial vector in the sense that it kind of is representing an infinitesimal rotation about that axis, basically. Yeah, so it'll map that axis to zero, and it'll map the plane perpendicular to it to something else, namely something along that axis. So if you think about the matrix representation of them, you can see how the dimensionality is consistent with it. Um, so in R3, your, your degrees of freedom in a skew symmetric tensor 
if you're looking at the degrees of freedom, you know, expressed relative to a basis that you can make a matrix of its components, um, you can really only specify three things, right? The when you have an orthonormal basis and are constructing one, the on diagonal elements all have to be zero, and these ones here have to be the additive inverse of these ones here. So there are one, two, three degrees of freedom that define a skew symmetric tensor in R3. Um, and it so happens that vectors also have three degrees of freedom. In R4, What do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six degrees of freedom for a skew symmetric tensor. So it is the case that um, that you don't have an axial vector to a skew symmetric tensor in any other dimension other than three. And so um, in order to, to show that every skew symmetric tensor in a three-dimensional space can be represented by an axial vector, um, we're going to construct this vector in component form relative to an orthonormal basis. Um, so let's... Uh, Kind of pick the result and show that it works. So whenever you have something like this, you know, somewhere someone filled a dumpster trying to figure it out, just kind of working from both ends of the problem until they got something that worked out nicely. Um, so to show this is the case, for capital Omega. Ugh. A ski symmetric tensor. Let's define this set of three scalars. Wi is equal to minus one half <clears throat> epsilon i j k omega j k, where these omega j k's are expressed relative to an orthonormal basis, an ordered orthonormal basis, you know, positively oriented. All right, and Again, someone is going to say, well, what happens if we multiply this by epsilon IPQ? Um, and that's another example of like, why epsilon IPQ? Well, someone a while ago did, you know, the math working from both ends of the problem and found that uh, this is the 
trick that makes it work. So you're just trying to prove that the two sides are equal. Um, you know, as long as you multiply both sides by the same thing and do the same manipulations to both sides, then once you get the same thing on the left side and the right side, you're done. But there's not like a, uh, a formula to doing that. You know, you have to try a bunch of things and eventually one of them will work. Or you can show that they're not equal. Um, all right, so what happens if we multiply by E I P Q? <coughs> So E I P Q W I is equal to minus one half E I P Q E I J K Omega J K. We can use the epsilon delta identity to say that this is equal to minus one half delta j p delta k q minus delta j q delta k p omega j k <coughs> And then this allows us to, you know, for the one term, we can identify J and P and K and Q. And for the other term, we identify J and Q and K and P, get rid of the deltas. So this is equal to minus one half omega P Q minus omega QP. But since omega is a skew symmetric tensor, its uh, list of scalar components relative to an orthonormal basis is itself skew symmetric. So this term here is equal to minus omega PQ. So we end up with the whole thing is equal to. omega qp and so that is to get rid of this additional minus sign that was sitting out in front we took omega pq in here right because this is all positive omega pq well that's equal to negative omega qp please come back all right well we have that epsilon i p Q is equal to epsilon Q I P. So epsilon Q I P W I is equal to omega Q P. And we remember before when we said what W cross was, this is the QP component to W cross. <clears throat> so the vector W equals WI EI with the WIs given by this formula here is called the axial vector of the tensor omega. And we can identify omega with W cross.
Um, notationally, when I make a skew symmetric tensor that has a corresponding axial vector, I tend to do W capital to represent that it's a skew symmetric one sub V vector V. It's the same as the tensor V cross. But when I'm making tensors, I like to have a capital letter with bold or two underlines if I'm writing it, um, just to remind myself that I have a tensor there, you know, because this one is like you only see vectors in there, so it's easy to forget that you have a tensor. That's it for today, and um, we'll come back in a little bit and do the trace of a tensor, an inner product, and maybe start thinking about spectral theory soon and the principal invariance. I'll uh, get those homeworks graded pretty soon. I think I have all the submissions now, and I'll post the solutions in the next day or two. Well. Maybe Monday. I'm going to be out of town for the weekend and away from cell service. Um, all right. Have a good one.